Well, it was a cold night in January of 2023 when we gathered together, uh, some of us, to hear about Vision 2025. It's four key initiatives, things that we really wanted to lock in on over the next three years uh, here at Connection. And I want to talk a little bit about those, each one of them, but then also kind of what's next for Connection. So one of those is actually 25 baptisms per year. Uh, the first year out of the gate, 2023, we had nine. It seems like it's not much, but man, that is nine people uh, that we saw enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ that is transformative without a shadow of a doubt. And then this year, that was number 17. Number 17. So that's 26. <clears throat> 26 baptisms over the last, uh, say, 20 months. And it has been an exciting journey that God has us on, and every one of those is an opportunity, right, to radically impact somebody's life, but also the other lives that come into contact with them. Another pillar that we set out for us was uh, 25 families. You'll, you'll notice a theme, 25, right, Vision 25. 25 new families come into connection. Now, this one's a little tricky to, to kind of put a, a, an exact number behind, but somewhere roughly in the neighborhood of 40 new families over the last 20 months, 40 new families. We did not aim high enough. We did not aim high enough. And so it's easy to adapt that. We just say 25 per year. And guess what? We're well on the way to that too. So that is three times what we thought, like just shooting from the hip out the gate, what this is going to look like. And then we said 25 new leaders identified serving in new capacities here at Connection. And, uh, and again, we've had some new ministries created. We've had some people shift roles. We've had new people step up. And this doesn't even count like people who are just like they're volunteering now and they weren't uh, 20 months ago. But we have somewhere around 20 people uh, serving in new leadership capacities here at Connection. And so that has also been just a huge, huge step that we have made along the way uh, here at Connection. And we're continuing to refine things, you know, as we, as we grow, as we attract new people, as we try to figure out how to do things more efficiently and effectively, like just trying to get that dialed in. And it's kind of like working on a car while you're driving it down the highway. You know, you're trying to, trying to make these adjustments to things. The, the last of the four key pillars is $2.5 million of giving capacity here at Connection. And, uh, and this one was the one that just like it scared the crap out of me. Like, oh, that's a lot of money. Like I grew up poor, like that is, but then you start looking at real estate around Columbus, Nebraska, and it's like, yeah, like it's, it's going to take a lot to make things happen. And you know what? Before we even sat down at that meal in January of 2023, we had, had been made aware that this facility was becoming available. And we were starting to make a move towards, like, what, what could this look like? And, and, and all, honestly, like, I feel like when we stepped out in faith and we started looking towards vision, then God started opening doors before us, and we started seeing things happen that we maybe wouldn't have seen otherwise. But you may not know that about a year into Connection, we started putting 10% aside to go towards a building fund like to go towards something that we hadn't achieved yet. And we didn't know when that was going to happen. But some of those resources were there. Uh, through the, the time frame, the last 20 months of the Vision campaign, we've raised over $30,000 specifically for the Vision Fund and what we've been able to, to accomplish here. And that doesn't count the things that are committed yet uh, for the Vision Fund that hasn't come in. And then on top of that, we were able to secure a loan through the Solomon Foundation uh, that allowed us to purchase this and then do some of the build-out that, that you guys have seen here. And we, we really just stretch those dollars and try to maximize them. So some of the things that uh, we have, like the chairs you're in, those are used, right, because they're affordable. And there are some things that didn't get done, like the flooring. But, but we're still in a facility, something that we didn't imagine and something that $2.5 million would suggest, man, this is going to be a hard thing to achieve but one of the things that I am I'm rock solid on is that we cannot put a price tag on volunteer hours. And there has been so many volunteer hours, people stepping up to make things happen around connection uh, up to this point. But I think even behind the scenes, things that you can't see. And it's easy to see that, like, man, without that vision, without, without God's provision, like, how would we be where we are? And now we're seeing uh, last couple of weeks attendance uh, creeping up on 200 
uh, average per week. That was, honestly, it's about 130 20 months ago. It's about 130. So you can see a huge uptick, and that's just average attendance. That's not people who count uh, connection as their church home. And so we're seeing good stuff happen there, but what's next for connection? What does that look like? Um, maybe you came in and you're like, man, this is, this is a great place. It feels like family. It's so friendly. How do we, how do we keep that and still uh, accomplish our mission of reaching even more people in the Columbus area for Jesus Christ? Those are very real questions that we have to wrestle with as we, we move forward. I want to encourage you to turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and I want you to see something kind of unfold here as we go through. Uh, so we're based out of something called the Restoration Movement. Uh, some of you may not know that. If you've gone through our uh, first look class or new attender class, then we usually try to hit this. But the Restoration Movement, in essence, boils down to uh, the, the following. There were a number of pastors who started breaking away from the, the churches that they were leading, or at least the denominations they were associated with, and they started finding out about each other. And what they found that they had in common was this, that they didn't really want to be associated with a denomination. They just wanted to be Christians. They didn't want to follow some religious leader. They wanted to follow Jesus. And they didn't really need a list of creeds and commands because they had the Bible. And so they said, let's just get back to that. Let's get back to the Bible. Let's just be Christians. Let's focus on Jesus that's the, the, the history of the restoration movement in a nutshell. But the restoration movement is an ongoing thing because we're constantly in this posture, in this position of how do we get back to what the early church did and make that look and feel like it did then while having all of the adjustments that we have to our, our schedules, our calendars, technology, and it's a constant refining process. But Acts gives us a picture, a glimpse into the early church and what the early church was doing, how they behaved, what they were committed to. And so after Jesus ascends back to heaven, now the early church is there uh, gathering together but on mission to reach more and more people that they might come to know Jesus more fully. So Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 38 in, uh, in page 910 in the Bibles we provide if you're there. So Peter has been preaching to uh, some of the, the people who are gathered around. They've just seen Jesus ascend to heaven, and he gets an opportunity just to unload with, on them with a very powerful, very pointed message about how they've crucified Jesus, the Son of God, but that the grave couldn't hold him. He is back, and he is the King of kings. And so the, then all the people are like, what do we do with this? How do we move on? And Peter responds with, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so all those who received, it says in verse 41, received the word, were, were baptized, and there were added to that day about 3,000 souls. And this was, this was a large gathering. This was definitely a monumental shift in what these people were doing. They heard a powerful message, and they were compelled to action. And this is really fitting with that first pillar, right? They, they were baptized. They were identifying. But we also see that they were gathering together, right? They were gathering together. And it goes on to say in verse 42, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Right, All who, were, who believed were together and they had all things in common. Right, We're seeing new families added to the numbers daily that were being saved. And then obviously you're going to need some new leaders to kind of come along with that. And this kind of fits with what we see in Romans chapter 12. Uh, Romans chapter 12 uh, in verse 3 says this, For by, gr by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, according, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let each of us use them in, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in serving, and if the, the one who teaches in his teaching, 
and the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Right? There are, are many gifts and we're all sent on mission to try to accomplish the work that God has wanted for us. So how do we get new leaders doing new things all for the benefit of the body of Christ all set in motion? And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, page 968, we see this, starting in verse 6. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Right? We're, we're striving to give to the kingdom, to give to the purpose, to give to the king, really, and so that we honor him above all things. That's something that the early church did and really hung their hat on. But I want to talk to us uh, specifically about what does this look like for us at Connection. Right? We said for a long time, we are a church without walls. And then we got some. Right? And, and now we have to purposely think like a church who doesn't have walls. Because walls limit vision. None of us can see outside of these walls. And if we get strapped on what is existing inside of these walls, then we get consumed by the space and, and its restraints. We get restrained by the amount of leaders that we have in place, the type of programs that we have here, right? And we get to thinking, like, this is all we've got. But vision goes well beyond walls. And guys, we have to be a church that is not limited to walls, right? That we have a mission that goes beyond the walls and into the community and beyond, that we have walls that are not designed by, by um, you know, the limited resources, but only tapped by what God has available for us, what He has made. And so we ask that God would just continue to give us a, a bigger, a greater, a grander vision for the things that He would want to accomplish and to be able to just strap up and enjoy the ride. Because when God has got this thing going, man, I think that momentum is a powerful thing. And the more that we ignite on mission for Jesus, the more our friends, families, coworkers, and classmates are going to show up. And the more that they show up, the more that we have to be ready to teach them, equip them, train them, and use them for the kingdom of God so that, that their friends and their family will come to know. And so what would it look like if three years from now, right? Because we set out in 2023 saying, what would three years from now look like? What if three years from now we're double what we are now? That means our average Sunday morning capacity is 400. That might mean we're at a third service. But one of the reasons you get to see all the chairs set up today is so you can see what we can fit in here. We have room for more, right? We have room for more, and we will make room for more. And at some point in time, I hope this is some point in time, well before we are financially prepared to do it, we're going to have to think what's beyond this facility, right? Because we are prepared to to go on mission for Jesus, and it's not about walls, right? It's not about home base. It's all about Jesus. It's about His love and His compassion and His mercy and His grace and for all the people who are not even yet here. That's vision, right? That's where we want to step into and where we want to go. And so we have to be a ministry-equipping center, right? It's not just about coming to church, but it's about being the church. It's about making sure that we're training up disciples of Jesus Christ who train up disciples of Jesus Christ who train up disciples of Jesus Christ that are making ripple movements throughout our communities, our homes, and our workplaces. That as people move out of this community and into another one, they're taking Jesus with them and we're seeing the spread of the gospel message into all tongues, tribes, and nations. Wouldn't that be a great vision? I think that's the vision of Jesus. Right? That's the vision of Jesus. It's not a huge marketing campaign. It's faithful people who will teach faithful people who will teach faithful people to keep on teaching. Right? And that's why we're here today. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Teach faithful men who will be faithful and teach others who teach others. Right? This is the, that commission that we talked about last week. Luke chapter 10, verse 2. Right? Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. You and I have that mission as well. The harvest is plentiful, it says, but the workers are few. 
what would it look like if we as a church family, we're, we're not just gathered here for the sake of us, but we're, we're here to plant new churches. In the life of Connection Christian Church, we have already uh, been an active part of two church plants beside our own. Uh, Hastings, we have Forge Christian Church, and, and we definitely donated resource, served on the management team for, continue to, for Willie Tryon and his team at, at Forge and Hastings. Uh, we just, uh, as we started this 2023 campaign it, on that cold night in November, or in January, that was, that was Fernando and Sarah E's like first week in Columbus, right? They went from, from Texas, Mexico area to welcome to the frozen tundra. But then by, by that fall, they were processing what it looks like to start a Hispanic church in Columbus. And now they're meeting in the afternoon. So not only did we go from 130 to about 200, they went from non-existent to about 40 people. Man, that's exciting. Now let me tell you something else. We put a, a portion of our contributions. When you give tithes and offerings here at Connection, a portion of that goes into church planning. And we are already at a place where we're ready to send another $20,000 to another church plant, right? We need a planter. We need, we need opportunities that are before us. Who can we train up and equip and unleash to, to bring the kingdom of God to another community around us? That's as exciting times. My hope is that three years from now, we're, we're sitting back and we're going, okay, we planted two more, right? And maybe, maybe that's one of those pillars we look at and go, oh, we didn't think big enough. We didn't think big enough. Look what God has done. Look at, at how the kingdom expansion has happened. One of the sad things, though, is Bible colleges, like the one that I attended, are no longer in existence. They've closed down. I didn't shut it down. It existed for a few more years past me, right? But, but Bible colleges are closing down, and churches are forced to figure out how do we take more personally the commission to raise up church leaders and to multiply so what would it look like if three years from now, we're not hiring somebody who went to Bible college, we're hiring somebody who went to Connection. There's somebody who was trained up right here in our ministry equipping center. Somebody who was raised up and knows what it's like to be a part of a church planting culture. Who is willing to take risks to reach people who don't know Jesus. Man, that's exciting for me. To think through three years from now, we could be a church planting movement that has, has begun because we're okay not doing the same old thing that we've always done. And we're seeing more and more this idea of bivocational or co-vocational church pastoring, which means like you can work your regular nine to fiver, pull down your paycheck and do the ministry stuff on the side. Like I could see us raising up teams and sending them out, but only if we're willing to let go of comfort and to strap on to the mission of Jesus. Like we, we want to join Jesus in what he's doing, wherever that, that takes us, and exciting things can happen there. I want to share with you three key shifts that I think are going to be fundamental for us to be able to step into this kind of vision. And these pieces are all coming uh, to from this Acts chapter 2 and beyond, the early church. What did they do? What did this look like? And how can we be a part of this mission? I think each one of these in themselves are kind of a vision for what we could be and what we could accomplish. But it's almost a vision like we're looking back and going, what did they do and how can we do it more effectively? Not more effectively than them, but more effectively now, today, to reach even more people. In Acts chapter 1, verse Eight, we see the words of Jesus before he ascended and he says to the, the, the believers that are gathered together, you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus had every intention of leaving behind a piece of himself in the Holy Spirit that, that would empower the people to do way more than they ever thought or imagined. And as they stepped into the calling to go off and to make disciples who make disciples. But they did it first at home base, and then they stretched in their region beyond them. We don't have the Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, but we have the Columbus and the surrounding area in the state of Nebraska and nationally. What would it look like if we took to heart that call and we sent planters out? We sent people who were faithful to the call of God to do these great things. And it starts here, and I think it starts by moving from shift number one, rows to circles. Right? We're shifting from rows 
to circles. If you look around the room, you, you'd realize we are in rows, right? You're focused on one talking head in front of you, usually mine, right? But you're not really engaging in a relationship. You're, you're not really in an iron sharpens iron, let's put some, some meat on this, this thing and move it forward, kind of a relationship. That was true in Acts chapter 2, right? Peter is up there and he's talking and the Holy Spirit is convicting and powerful things are happening. And as he did so, more than 3,000 people were added to the church on that day. Man, that's an exciting time. But they didn't stay in rows. They didn't gather around a, a singular speaker again and again. They got involved in community. They got in, in circles, And in Acts chapter 2, we see that move take place, right? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayers. They they ate together. They did life together. They they communed together, but they also studied together. They learned together. They prayed together. And we saw them move from the the rows and into the circles, Guys, I think that that's something that we can and that we should do, and that's probably a pretty good reason why that's one of our core values, right? That we don't just connect on Sunday morning gatherings, but we grow intimately in circles. We do life together. We challenge each other. We pray for and encourage each other, just as the early church was gathered together and doing that for each other. It says that they were all together, and they had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and just distributing them to anybody who had need. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Right? The second shift that we need to make is from sitting to serving. From sitting to serving. Right? And you'll see that as one of our core values too. How do we engage in service together? We have to get out of our chairs. We got to get out of our seats and we got to get to work. And this is, this is maybe moving us beyond our comfort zone because it's easy to come in and, and watch other people do things and let other people do things for us. In America, we are very good at that, at just taking a back seat and letting things unfold. But as the church, we are unleashed on mission for Jesus, which means we get out of our chairs and we get to work. We follow after Jesus who said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. This is the call for us, right? We don't hide that. It's, it's nothing new out of the gate. We don't bait and switch, like come in and be comfortable and then let's go to work. No, let's come in and let's receive. But as we've been given, let us go give. Let us be an extension of the grace and the mercy that we've received. To be able to reach other people the same as, as people took time to reach me, Now, I'm going to challenge us with something here in this particular category that I think is going to stretch in probably some very weird ways, what we've been doing at Connection. Remember that whole driving down the road and working on the car at the same time thing? So we want our ministries to be able to continue. We still want you to be able to serve in those ministries, serve in the community and the special events. But what would it look like if we approached it differently? And I'll say it this way. What I want you to think about, church, is how can we do less more effectively? If you could examine your time and, and, and actually do less but do it better, do you think that would be a win? I think it would be a win for our ministry leaders. That, that they had people on their teams that were more committed, more passionate, more energetic, more kingdom-focused on their teams doing the work that they needed to do. But what if I were to tell you that what if we cut that down to about half? Let's say we had half as many people doing twice as much. So what, did that, what does that look like? Well, how about, let's start with our kids' ministry. What if everybody who served in the kids' ministry loved Jesus wholeheartedly and loved kids? And they viewed this not as an opportunity to fill a gap and to take a seat that needed to be filled, but they actually viewed it as an opportunity to love on children in the name of Jesus, who viewed this as an opportunity to make disciples of these young kids, who had an opportunity to to maybe step in and change family trees, to change ancestries for generations to come, to train up a child in the way that they might go. Man, if we had half as many people doing it twice as, as passionately, twice as energetically, twice the much the call of God, I think we, that would be a game changer. 
And so here's my call, right? Do what you're doing less so that you can do what you're continuing to do more and better, right? If you're involved in five or six ministries, thank you, right? Thank you. Everybody around here is going to challenge you to step up and serve. That's what we do, right? But I want to challenge you to not serve in so many places. What, what are one or two things that you can do, and how can you do them with excellence? What are one or two things that you can do, and how can you do them with excellence? And maybe that, that you're willing to greet twice as often or at twice as many services, but, but that's where your passion and energy is at. Maybe you're in the worship team and you're, you're only serving there, but you're doing it twice as often with twice as much of your time going into that area. I have no idea what this is going to look like, but I do know that we are in a world that is increasingly busy. Any of you guys ever feel busy, overwhelmed, got a lot going on? Right? So what if we actually just focused on a couple of things and we did it with excellence? Right? I don't know what that's going to look like. We may end up shaking things up and I go, oh crap, why'd I start? Right? But I'm wondering if, what if we thought through things a little bit differently and we were willing to approach it in a, in a different way that no matter whether somebody came through the kids' ministry, the youth ministry, our small group ministry, uh, they came to a Sunday morning service, they would know without a shadow of a doubt these people absolutely care about me and they care about Jesus and they want what's best for me. Because I think that that's exciting. I think that that's a vision worth stepping into. I, I think that we would love to have people who are on fire who want to be engaged. And I get, like, this is not you all the time. It's not me all the time either. Believe it or not, even as a pastor, there are times I'm like, just, can I stay in bed? Can I just, like, not show up? Will somebody cover for me? Like, that'd be all right? Right, but there are so many opportunities that exist before us. But we have to move from sitting to serving. And along the way, I want you to ask this question, who am I developing, right? Because I'm not just serving. Every person that comes in the front door is an opportunity to change a life, to change an eternity. Who are you taking along with you on this journey, right? Who are you inviting to serve with you? Don't do ministry alone. Who are you inviting to serve with you? We have something around here we call it the discipleship square, right? I'm going to do something, and I'm going to invite somebody to watch, and then I'm going to do something and I'm going to invite them to help. And then I'm, I'm going to let them do it and I'm going to help them. And then I'm going to release them to do it and I'm just going to be there to watch, to coach, to guide. Who can I bring along on this journey? Shift number one, from rows to circles. Shift number two, from sitting to serving. And shift number three, inst- institutional to personal. Institutional to personal. And what I mean by that is that it's so easy for us to read something like the Great Commission, right? To go and make disciples of all nations, to baptize them, to teach all that I have commanded, right? It's so easy to go, that's the church's job and not my job. And what I want us to do is to take seriously that call on our life, right? Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Our call individually, personally, is to seek and to save the lost. This is not the church's job. It is but only as much as we are the church. And what this means is that you and I, probably the greatest shift ever, is that we shift our mindset from going to church to actually being the church. Right? That we're willing to step into the lives of people uh, who are broken, who are hurting, who are struggling, who, who maybe are critical of the church and critical of organized religion, and we have an opportunity to give them grace and mercy, a love that is beyond all understanding through Jesus because he's transformed our life. We are a witness to that. And we want to be his witnesses to Columbus and the surrounding area and to Nebraska and beyond, right? But we have to move it from it's the church's job to it's my job, right? Who am I reaching? Who am I loving? Who am I serving? And we say it around here like, who's your one? right? The one focus. Who is that one person that God has placed in my life that I need to love on, encourage, serve, pray for? And then I would say it like this too. Connection, every one matters, right? That one that you've been praying for, that one that's part of your family, that one that's there in in your workplace, that's our one too. And every one 
matters. And that's why we do what we do. That's why we cannot help but to, to take seriously the commission of God. We want to connect people in the Columbus area to Jesus Christ because everyone matters. And we'll do it in a way that brings faith to life because they need to see that church isn't just something you go to. It's who you are. Right, and, and so we want to be an active part of that. And that's why when you step up to volunteer at Connection, you are more than just a warm body. Right? You are a difference maker. You are somebody who is a part of the mission of Jesus Christ, and you help us to accomplish His will for us around here. Now, that is a different perspective. And guys, we care about you way more, and we try to say this and probably never say it enough. Right? We cannot do what we do without you, and you are more valuable to us than what you do. And so if we need to just step into your life and help you through a, 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 struggling, uh, a struggle or a, a, a difficult time, let us do that. Like if you need to, to step back from a serving role, I get that, but don't step back from God. Right? Lean into God and let us come alongside of you and suit up to be a difference maker. Because I think if we can make these shifts, right, if we, can, if we can shift from rows to circles, if we can shift from sitting to serving, and if we can go from uh, uh, being a part of an institutional commission to a personal commission, I think we're going to see life change take place. And the result of that is a church getting bigger, not because we're focused on a church, because we're focused on a Jesus who makes all things new. And that's the kind of Jesus that we want to serve. Amen? So what are we going to do about that? What are you, what are you personally going to do about that? What do you need to do less in your life or in your church work? And what are you going to do more, more effectively, with more commitment, with more zeal? What's your next step? Father, we are blessed to see a pattern established by an early church who knew what it was like to be convicted, cut to the heart, realize that they were not good enough, that they had completely screwed things up, but that you have made them new through Jesus Christ. We have that same grace here available to us today. And Father, help us to step into that grace. Help us to step into community with other believers who are on this same journey with us, that we can do life together, that we can understand and grow together but also that we can learn to serve together. Right? Just as, as you called the early church to, to raise up and serve, and we see in Acts chapter 6 with the appointing of the deacons, like where is it that we need to step up and step out in faith? Where is it that we need to engage in this, this mission to be able to witness to the people around us? Or as we see in Acts chapter 8, how the persecution led to the scattering of your people. Help us to see that it's more than about gathering, but it's also about scattering. The scattering to the places around us that other people might see you more clearly in us. Father, I have no doubt that you have bigger things in store for us than we could ever think or imagine. 25 that's just a number for us. Father, help us to be kingdom-minded and focused on, on one, one who is lost, one who is hurting, one who is broken, and one that needs to know about you. Father, if there are any of those here today, may they just receive your message, receive your grace, and know that there's something more for them. Pray this in Jesus' name.